everybody and uh, welcome to this session. Um, I hope that um, we're going to have a, a really nice session this afternoon talking about uh, nursing our sick cats at home, which I think is a, a relevant topic to talk about in the current situation we all find ourselves in where access to veterinary clinics is much more limited. Um, so I've uh, selected this topic as one which I, I hope you'll find very helpful in the current climate. And I'll be honest that when I thought of it as a topic um, I perhaps didn't think exactly how big a topic it could be and it's ended up being a little bit of a bigger presentation that I than I had planned so I think about half an hour I hope that's okay for you um, there definitely is room for further sessions and, and obviously if you have comments or suggestions for further sessions um, please definitely make them uh, to me um, but I think what really became clear to me looking at this topic overall, again in our current climate, um, is that there is so much that carers can do to contribute to the health care of their pets and therefore your involvement is uh, absolutely critical as you'll know it's lovely to see the cats on your screens actually thank you for sharing videos those of you that are doing so I'm stuck in our attic today actually just because our broadband's been very flaky so I hope it's not going to fall off but if it does I will record this session and uh, come what may we'll get this information to you so moving back to our topic, um, really the focus of this is what, what can you as carers um, hear from me that might help you in terms of caring for your cats. And first key message is always to trust your instincts. If you feel something's not right with your cats, then you are correct as far as I'm concerned and you should contact your vet clinic for advice. So, so don't hesitate. If you've got a worry, um, then it is real in my opinion and uh, you should contact the vet clinic it because even if after a discussion it seems maybe not to be something of concern today it's always better to to check that out some emergencies obviously are very um, very clear emergencies as well so if your cat collapses is um, frothing at the mouth is seizuring um, is unconscious is bleeding you're not going to be thinking shall I or shan't I contact my vet those those emergencies are very clear but what I wanted to really focus on today was the situations where you just are aware there's something not quite right and you're worried about it and you're not quite sure what action is appropriate appropriate and, and what you can, can do uh, to help uh, your cat to recover. And with respect to that, again, the first message is always speak to your vet clinic. But um, this is the section of, of the webinar that really expanded for me because we've been forced as a profession to move into telemedicine, remote consultations by the coronavirus lockdown. And that means that now we don't have necessarily the option of examining our patients um, as often as we would like. And it made me really focus on what you as a carer can provide in the way of information that can really help me and my colleagues as clinicians clinicians. And being a specialist in internal medicine, um, then I would always say that uh, what we call the history, which is gathering patient data, is the most helpful part of our assessment anyway. So this is the bit we do without touching the animal at all, asking questions as to you know, what has changed at home, um, what have you noticed, and, and uh, gathering all that information. That is the most important part of the consultation, and it really helps to guide us as clinicians as to well what might be the cause of this change what tests might I need to do what treatments might be appropriate and what is shown on this slide is an extract from a questionnaire that is free to access on my website so on vetprofessionals.com if you go to the um, helpful info top menu and then look at free downloads you do need to register to access this bit of the website, but it's, there's there's no charge to that. And uh, we are very GDPR compliant. We won't send you any emails that you don't sign up for. But if you go into that section of the website and look in the free downloads for vets, one of those is a senior cat health questionnaire. And whilst it's obviously focused on the older cat, this extract that I, I have here very much is uh, general health questions which apply. And so before, um, if there's a non-urgent 
inquiry, which you're worried about and you want to speak to your vet about, I would say the first thing might be to think how you would answer these questions, because if you can provide that information to your vet straight away, they're going to be much better informed. So have you noticed any change in thirst, appetite, breathing, ability to eat, all these sorts of questions as listed on here um, can definitely be a very useful starting point. Beyond that, um, there is some other clinical information, in fact, that you can collect. So normally we would do this in the consulting room. We would be observing the patient, trying to see whether there are visible abnormalities. And, and hopefully the, the video is working properly here as well. You can see um, a very, very unwell cat that um, is uh, pretty flat out um, in the vet hospital. But the reason I put this video in was really to illustrate that also by observing this cat, we can monitor the respiratory rate, the breathing rate. And so counting breaths per minute, if you think your cat's breathing is not quite right, this is one of the actual measurements that's really helpful to be able to provide to your vet. And if, for example, you say to your vet, well, actually, I've noticed my cat is taking about 50 breaths per minute your vets will instantly know that is a very abnormal, very fast breathing rate and uh, probably will be a situation where you, we would want to see your cat in the clinic, even in spite of the lockdown constraints, because that's, you know, that would be very worrying to us. If your cat at rest is breathing with their mouth open, um, as in the, the photograph on this slide, then that too would be considered very abnormal. Cats, as, as you all know, um, they don't normally breathe with their, their mouth open. Um, sometimes they will if they're a bit stressed. So travel to a vet clinic, waiting in a, a busy waiting room on a hot day, especially you might see your cat panting. And in fact, the, the cat here was totally healthy, um, but had come in for, for vaccination and was really quite stressed and was breathing uh, with the mouth open, which is quite distressing, I think, to see as a clinician and uh and uh, for the cat's owner as well. Um, but it, it settled very quickly. So we knew also from assessing the cat that uh, breathing in general wasn't a problem. However, if at home your cat is breathing with their mouth open and really struggling to breathe, then that clearly would be something of concern. And with respect to breathing as well, this is just some other pointers that you that might be helpful for your vets. So if the breathing is noisy, if you can work out, is it noisy breathing in or breathing out? or both um, and uh, what what further information can you provide and in fact can you get a video for example. Beyond that something else that we will also do um, within our consultation is of course examine our patient in other ways so we will typically listen to the chest um, using our stethoscope. Now I wouldn't expect any of you unless you're medical professionals to have a stethoscope at home but you may be able to still count your cat's heart rate and that could be important information for your vets in some situations and to uh, normally um, to you can feel the cat's heart beating um, and if you feel with your hands either side of, of the chest just sort of behind your cat's armpit um, you can actually feel the heart beating and you can count how many beats there are in a minute a quarter of a minute or or whatever as as per this slide um, and that too might be in some situations useful information to be able to provide uh, to your vets we also sometimes, even without laying a hand on the cat, can get an idea of abnormalities relating to colour of what we call the mucous membranes. So these are, uh, for the cat, uh, it would include the gums, the sclera, which is the white of the eye, um, and uh, the nose is often a good place to look if it's not pigmented. So if the nose has not got black or brown pigment, as is the case in the picture on the left, we normally a cat would have quite a nice pink nose because their blood uh, contains plenty of, of uh, red blood cells but this cat was very anemic and you can see that actually the nose looks quite white. Now if that anemia has happened quite slowly, quite gradually, then as a carer at home it may not be that obvious, um, even more so if this is your only cat, you've not got another cat for comparison. Um, but if something's changed suddenly um, that uh, is likely to be more obvious. 
And the picture on the right hand side is a cat with a, a problem where the, the blood was actually being broken down, what's called a hemolytic anemia. And that was causing a jaundice, yellow discoloration. And you can see that the whites of the eyes are very yellow, but also that cat's nose uh, looks quite yellow as well. So even without touching the cat, you may get some clues. But then if your cat is uh, allows you to lift up a lip and have a look at the gums, uh, you may also get some more information. So if the gums are pink and also if your cat will let you just gently touch them, they should feel quite moist. If they feel sticky, uh, like blue tack, then that can be an indication of dehydration. And if you're worried about dehydration, that's that can be a useful little bit of data um, to collect. Um, and again, we've got examples here of pale membranes, uh, pale gums, and also the jaundiced gums. Again, it's the same cat as, as from the previous slide. Mentioning dehydration, something else that you probably have seen your vet do at some point or other is look for evidence of dehydration by a procedure that we call a skin tenting test. So normally when you lift up the loose skin of the scruff and you let go, it should really spring back into place very, very quickly. And um, this example just shows uh, one of the nurses lifting it up and, and it's, you know, it's not too bad in this example. I wouldn't say it's dramatically abnormal, but if we look at this uh, black cat on the right hand side at the bottom you can see just what a difference there is there the skin just you know doesn't even settle down having been let let go it just sort of stays in in that um, uh, abnormal sort of tent so this cat is on on a drip so it's receiving treatment for dehydration but still clearly is very dehydrated Temperature might be an ask too far for you, but if you do have a small digital thermometer um, and uh, potentially with, you know, uh, discussion with your vets, you may be, may be happy to collect a rectal temperature at home. There are also some ear um, temperature devices that can be used in pets as well. Uh, not all of them are wonderfully reliable, but, you know, there, there are some options out there. So if monitoring temperature, temperature looks helpful, there are ways that you can assess that at home but um, it's it's not something that um, you know perhaps always is going to be needed uh, you may be relieved to hear other information that's really helpful is really knowing what your cat is doing in terms of the litter tray or if you do know if they go outside, if you've witnessed anything at all that is helpful in that department, um, then that also is really useful information. So even just very basic things like is the cat still passing urine? Um, is it passing about the same amount as it would do normally? Um, this is one advantage if your cat does use a litter tray of having a clumping cat litter is you actually can see very clearly the size and number of urine clumps in the tray um, and therefore get some information. And of course, if you have more than one cat, the information that you get may just be for the household. So it may not be um, just for that, that single cat, um, but it is still useful information because if there is a cat that you're worried about and anything changes in the house, it probably is related to the cat you're worried about. If, for example, you've, you've noticed one of your cats is seeming a bit depressed, a bit out of sorts. Um, most normal healthy cats will pass urine two or three times a day and pass feces once a day. That would be typical. Um, if, of course, you see an abnormality um, on your cat, so for example, uh, you've noticed uh, in the left hand uh, picture here that this cat has a slightly scabby looking nose. It just, you know, um, may be the sort of thing that you, you look at it and you think, is, is this or isn't this anything to worry about? Well, taking a photo is really helpful um, for providing uh, information for your vets, but also for monitoring things, because if something has sort of been creeping up up over a period of time and you have a record therefore of what it looks like you can see is it getting worse or is it getting better you know perhaps for example with this nose picture well was my cat in a fight last week and it got a scratch on its nose and it will get better um, or alternatively could this be something a little bit more concerning so photos really helpful and the cat on the right had some uh, some chin uh, acne lesions that sort of black um, uh, lump appearance just uh, just below the lower lip so photos definitely helpful 
Um, videos also can be helpful. So ho hopefully you're seeing what I'm seeing, which is firstly on the left, we, I've, I've taken the sound away, but uh, uh, having a, a coughing fit um, and uh, information really, you know, other than asking um, owners to do an impression of what their cat is doing at home. Of course, a video is a really useful way of seeing, well, what are you seeing at home and what information uh, can that help to, to provide me with? Uh, the cat on the right hand side had some behavioural changes, was vocalising a lot and pacing around the house um, and uh, ultimately uh, we think these changes were a result of uh, cognitive dysfunction syndrome which is uh, the cat equivalent of Alzheimer's disease but this was a, a video record that was submitted um, by the cat's owner. So videos definitely can be helpful. Sometimes, of course, they're very large files and can be hard to get to your vet. Um, for me, I would tend to use something like WhatsApp to share a video. That often works very well. So if your vets are happy uh, to accept uh, you know, a, a WhatsApp uh, transfer of video, that's, uh, that generally works. Other information? Well, certainly I think if you are a, a keen and dedicated cat owner, which you probably are by virtue of, of listening to this session, then it is useful to have some cat sized scales at home if you can. Um, and they don't have to be veterinary scales. You can use scales that are designed for babies. So uh, websites like Amazon, for example, if you search for baby scales or paediatric scales, you will see a, a range of scales come up uh, and uh, they do vary in price from time to time. But certainly I've, I have seen and I've bought scales for around about £30, so not a massive amount of money. Um, and the advantage then of having scales is that, again, you can collect this data at home. So all of the things I've mentioned, in fact, you know, do apply beyond lockdown down because as we know taking a cat to a vet is pretty stressful so if you're monitoring your cat long term and you want some advice and, and perhaps you, you don't think necessarily your cat needs to go into the clinic then being able to provide this sort of level of data for your vets is really helpful so being able to weigh your cat would definitely fall into that category and if you are just using scales as part of a health monitoring of an older cat, I would say that um, certainly for all cats, you want to weigh them at least once a year. But once the cat reaches the age of 11, I would probably say every two or three months is a good idea to just collect a weight measurement. Um, once your cat's 15 years and over, maybe make that once a month. And the key thing really is that you want, of course, your cat to be a healthy weight, and you want its weight to be stable. So if weight is coming down, even if it's a very, very, very slow creep downwards, if it's consistently heading down, that is significant. Um, and that's the sort of time where I, I would want to be involved if I were your vet in terms of discussing, well, why might this be? And there are a lot of illnesses of older cats that are treatable um, to a greater or lesser degree, but uh, where early diagnosis, I think, can make a, a better impact as well on outcome. So body weight assessment, I think, is really helpful. Other measurements, uh, water consumption. Um, well, that can be useful in some situations, both diagnostically, but also monitoring success of treatment. Um, so to do to, to measure how much your cat is drinking, um, if you have one cat and it's indoor only, of course, is the easiest situation. And you would have a jug of uh, a known quantity of water, let's say 500 mils or a litre, which you then put into one or more empty bowls around the household and then 24 hours later, you tip the contents of the bowls back into that jug, measure what's there, and then you can calculate the difference, which is what your cat has drunk. And even if you have a multi-cat household uh, or multi-animal household, there's a dog as well. Um, if you've noticed uh, a change in your, your cat's thirst, it can still be helpful to look at the whole household water consumption, particularly when it comes to monitoring. And uh, a classic um, condition where monitoring thirst is really helpful would be diabetes, diabetes mellitus, where we would expect water consumption thirst to drop when the diabetes comes under under control. Food intake also could be really helpful. So again, if you're worried about your cat's appetite, um, then it can be useful to measure and weigh what you put uh, out for them and what they eat, where, whether you're worried that they're eating too much or not eating enough. 
and all of that information can then be collated and can be really helpful in terms of um, patient management. So this is just one example, a patient that I've, I've been managing for some time, a cat called Sula, who has chronic kidney disease. And uh, she's been uh, doing very well with her extremely dedicated owners at home. And this is uh, just one of the charts that they sent to me, which reported how much food Sula was being offered and exactly what she was eating, how her body weight was doing. Doing. And this level of data was really helpful to me in advising them with respect to the food that was being offered and uh, appetite stimulants as needed for her kidney disease. So you can never have too much data, even if it can look a little bit overwhelming. It's always really helpful in informing decisions. Other information that you might be able to uh, collect for us uh, would include samples. So um, urine samples can be collected at home. There is a download on the website, um, again, in that free download section I mentioned, which explains how to collect a urine sample from a cat at home. Um, probably many of you will have done that already. That can be extremely helpful. Of course, a poo sample, if your cat has diarrhea, can be very helpful as well. And that's something that you may easily be able to collect if your cat is using an indoor tray. Um, and again, with respect to diabetes, monitoring blood glucose levels at home um, is something that uh, many owners do and do absolutely brilliantly and that also can be extremely helpful in terms of uh, working with with the vet to give advice on insulin dosage and management of diabetes so there's lots of things that can be done at home Keeping a diary that tries to collate this information um, can be really helpful and they, there may be certain things which are important for your cat uh, and its condition that perhaps are not important to other cats. So um, tailoring the, the diary to your, your situation can be useful. And another example of where um, some owner data here had a, a really significant impact on uh, management is, is Toots here, a diabetic cat, and um, her owner was monitoring water consumption. As I mentioned, if, uh, if you're diabetic, often you're very thirsty. And when your diabetes is brought under control with insulin therapy, your thirst should decrease. And the left-hand picture shows Toots's water intake actually each line is a 12 hour period rather than 24 hour period so Toots was drinking up to half a litre of water a day so half a litre in 24 hours um, on the left hand page but once the diabetes came under control if we look on the right hand page towards the bottom you can see that dropped to about 120 mils per day. Toots did have some kidney disease as well so thirst was never completely normal shall we say um, but the great thing about her owner having monitored this was that when subsequently she did from time to time um, get a urinary tract in, in, uh, infection um, her thirst increased it was very obvious to her carer and uh, he was very good at collecting urine samples and bringing them into the clinic so that good teamwork really from uh, his perspective collecting the data uh, understanding it and uh, and us being able to assist in terms of the actual diagnosis. Seizure management at home, hopefully not something that you're um, uh, going to have to um, uh, experience too many times, but I just thought I'd put one slide on it in here just because if it does happen often, of course, it's very unannounced and can be quite scary. And if you've not had a, a pet with a seizure before um, or even a person with a seizure before, it, it can be very, very scary and unnerving to see. Um, but our advice um, in the instant of seeing this is to uh, firstly ensure that, that uh, um, your cat can't hurt themselves by where they are. So if they're having a seizure on the edge of a bed and you think they're about to fall off, then perhaps actually moving them onto the floor um, is a safe thing. But otherwise would be to turn off lights, turn off anything that makes any noise, make the environment as calm and quiet as possible. If your cat is diabetic and having a seizure, then it may be related to low blood glucose. So the next thing will be to get some glucose powder uh, or failing that even honey or sugar that you could put on the gums that may have an instant impact in terms of helping blood sugar levels to recover. If your cat is not known to be diabetic, um, then uh, typically blood glucose levels are not going to be a cause of the seizure. Um, but that would be the time where certainly if by now the seizure is still occurring, 
get on the phone to your vets um, useful if possible potentially as well to video any seizure activity um, and actually time how long it lasts as well in case of future episodes so that information could be helpful so let's finish with some general tips for supporting cats where there are specific concerns. So feeding advice, firstly. Um, well, what can I tell you that you might not know? Well, cats, um, in terms of food bowls, they tend to prefer metal, glass or ceramic dishes to plastic dishes. Um, there are some really lovely plastic dishes out there and some cats are absolutely fine having their food out of a plastic dish but um, overall the preferences are against it so more for glass and ceramic so um, if you have a cat that is is being a bit fussy about food that might be something that you can you can change and you don't need to buy a special cat bowl you know a a china uh, plate that we use for ourselves is going to be also acceptable from the cat's perspective they dislike their whiskers touching the sides of the bowls um, so generally shallow bowls are more popular than than a bowl that the cat would have to put its head into and as you might imagine in terms of a place to eat somewhere calm and quiet is generally more popular popular than any busy places where there's a lot of, of human traffic particularly if you're feeling a bit sorry for yourself if you have an elderly cat they may have arthritis affecting their elbows their shoulders and their neck vertebrae and that can mean that crouching down to eat can be uncomfortable so raising the food bowl might make it a little bit easier for them to eat and uh, as you can see on the slide you can get some really beautiful raised ceramic food bowls for cats um, but also you can as, as I did for the bottom picture just open your kitchen cupboard find a plastic bowl uh, to use as a surface to raise uh, your normal cat bowl and uh, test out that theory if you think it might be a possibility for your cat. If your cat has lost their appetite recently, um, this cat has, has cat flu, which may or may not be apparent in the photo, but very bunged up, feeling very, very sorry for himself. Um, then the sorts of things that can help will be firstly offering foods that are familiar, but also some that are different. So sometimes the cat will prefer a new food, even if they don't stay on it for, forever. Also trying very smelly foods, things like tuna, pilchard, sardines, um, you know, all these sorts of things can be quite popular smelly foods. Um, also, if you can help wipe away any discharges, anything that might be blocking the nose, um, affecting the sense of smell, um, that can help. Um, adding a little bit of water also and warming the food slightly um, can also help make it more palatable. The buffet option, which I've, I've said to avoid here, is um, really where if you have a cat that's feeling very poorly, um, to resist the temptation to just open every different sort of cat food you might have in your house and perhaps every smelly delicious thing that you have in your cupboard that you think your cat might like and offer it all at the same time so overwhelming the cat potentially with lots of very smelly normally very palatable but possibly overwhelming odors and sights that actually can be counterproductive it can cause what we call a food aversion which is where if you're feeling ill um, and just imagine you know that you've had the worst gastroenteritis in the world and then someone puts a sort of enormous gigantic feast in front of you that you may start to associate feeling ill with the sight and smell of that food and so the last thing you're going to do is actually eat that food. Warming the food gently can certainly help. Uh, sometimes putting a little bit of food on a paw or on the nose can trigger a little bit of a response and if you're lucky, I mean this cat looks you know completely uninterested in the food but if you're lucky um, then the cat when they lick that will think oh actually that's not so bad yes okay I'm happy to have a little bit to eat so it might be a little little bit of a trigger to start things off definitely little and often is is for cats is the way to go that is their natural way of eating um, and lastly if your cat likes playing with catnip and you have any dry catnip in your house then just sprinkling a little bit of that catnip onto the food can help stimulate appetite in some cats. Uh, also, there is a nutritional supplement called Fortiflora, um, which uh, often we use for cats with gastrointestinal problems. Um, but anecdotally, it does seem to be that that also for some cats increases the palatability of the food as well. If your cat's also receiving medication, um, then try not to uh, medicate the cat at the same time as you're offering them food because uh, if they associate 
associate that a stress of being given a pill with them being offered food. Again, they may start to associate food is a bad thing. I don't want to eat. So try and separate that. And indeed, if there are enough people in your house to have someone who's gives the medication, someone who's the sort of nasty person in the house, and then someone else is the nice person and does just the nice things like feeding and grooming and you know and doesn't do any of the medication then that that can work well as well in the short term it really doesn't matter if the, the diet is not balanced as long as it's not poisonous to the cat so things that are poisonous would include garlic and onions so be very careful about uh, buying things like cooked chicken from a supermarket where often it has been basted in onion and, and garlic um, and that can actually be in enough quantities to be poisonous to a cat um, so if you're home cooking that's fine you don't you just avoid things like onions and garlic um, and in the short term even if your cat will only eat prawns you know for a, a few days it's not going to be a problem in terms of it not being a balanced diet clearly if that were the case for weeks or longer then that would not be a good uh, plan but in the short term just thinking of you know a couple of days or so um, really uh, it's fine for your cat to to live on prawns if that's what they like there are some veterinary convalescent diets as well um, and you can get those online although you might need to buy a tray of 24 or something that are very impractical but your vet clinics also will have these things like Hills AD, uh, Royal Canin convalescence and recovery diets. Um, and uh, so they may be able to provide you with just, you know, one or two tins of these to try at home. Mashing up the food, adding water can help with uh, elderly cats that have dental problems. Um, and again, speak to your vets really if you are concerned about appetite. In general, I would say don't uh, don't resort to syringing your cats with food. Um, a number of reasons, are, as I've outlined on this slide, um, it is generally impossible to actually syringe an adequate amount of nutrition into a cat because typically, even with the very concentrated liquid diets, we need to syringe 150 mils or more into the cat a day, which is a huge amount of liquid to syringe. That's the five mil syringe that's shown in the, the photograph on this slide. So that's the first thing, but, but most cats also just don't tolerate it. And so it can be very stressful for them. Um, if they fight it, they may inhale the food and that can cause pneumonia. But also, uh, again, this is something else that can lead to a food aversion where just that, you know, that that experience puts the cat off eating completely. So if, if you remain concerned, if these, these gentle encouragements that I've talked about at home are not helping, um, then definitely, again, make sure you speak to your vets and ask their advice. It may be that your cat has a diagnosis already, and so you, you know why appetite is poor. Perhaps your cat does have kidney disease and if that's the situation then your vet in this uh, era of lockdown may be comfortable to make a prescription for example of an appetite stimulant or something to help with nausea if that's thought to be a, a problem over the phone and the, the rules for us being able to prescribe over the phone or video consultations have been relaxed in view of the the covid situation um, but if your cat doesn't have a diagnosis uh, your vet may well um, depending on on the urgency that is, is portrayed by you and the information you're able to collect with your cat may feel that further investigations really are necessary uh, to try and support your cat and uh, hopefully those will, will be possible. Complete loss of appetite definitely in cat terms is an emergency in that within a few days of complete loss of appetite, so the cat not eating anything at all, really serious uh, processes start to be triggered in the body that can and be fatal quite quickly. So um, again, if at all worried, definitely don't hesitate to contact your vets. Encouraging drinking is the last thing to mention, just because um, obviously for some situations, again, the kidney cats that we've talked about a little bit, dehydration uh, can be an issue. There is an entire download on the website in the owner section of the, the free downloads that um, has a whole list of tips to encourage drinking in cats where that is um, thought to be helpful. Um, so just a few, um, a few highlights on this slide really. So again, cats tend not to like the plastic bowl to drink out of where possible. Again, there are always exceptions. So if you have a cat and it has a plastic water fountain that it loves, then don't, don't get rid of it based on 
what I'm saying here. However, if you're feeling the need to encourage drinking in your cat, consider, I would say, prioritizing the glass, uh, metal and ceramic dishes rather than plastic and experiment. You know, some cats like a very wide, very shallow dish. Uh, some cats like drinking out of a jug. Um, some cats appreciate the bowl being raised. Some prefer rainwater or mineral water to tap water. You can also make broths for your cats. So you can poach perhaps some chicken or fish in some water. Water. Uh, once the chicken or fish is cooked, uh, you can let that cool down. And if it's uh, acceptable for your cat to, to have as food, then obviously the cat potentially can have that or you can eat it um, or someone else can eat it. And then the water, when it cools down, is, is like a, a nice infusion of um, the chicken or the fish that you've cooked. And, and that can be offered as a drink. So all these sorts of things can uh, help to make a difference. Beyond that as well, remember that our cats love being clean and if they're neglecting themselves because they're not feeling very well, they might appreciate a little bit of grooming, a little bit of TLC, uh, wiping away any discharges from the eyes and the nose, all those sorts of things can, can really make a big difference to well-being. So in summary, don't hesitate to get in touch with your vet if you have any concerns and, and don't ever feel like you're bothering your vet and that they don't want to hear from you because that is never the case. Even if everyone is quite anxious at the moment, they will not want you to be worrying at home uh, rather than not phoning them. They would want you to phone them and ask for their advice. If you can provide them with as much information as possible, it really gives them the best chance of being able to give you the, the best quality information that is hopefully going to lead to the correct diagnosis as quickly as possible. And then, of course, the correct treatment can be administered. So that is the reason I've, I've spent such a long time saying what information you can gather at home. And uh, of course, you play a vital role in uh, the ongoing care of your cat with whatever illness it has. You you know it's your care that makes the difference um, and the, hopefully that involvement of the vet clinic so it's you your cat and your vet uh, clinic all working uh, closely together is going to have the best uh, possible outcome so I've mentioned some resources on the website that just shows you the helpful info menu um, and the free downloads that I've mentioned with respect to collecting urine samples from cats um, and uh, encouraging your cat to drink more are a couple that I've mentioned. Um, the iCat Care website also a really fantastic set of resources there that you may find um, of interest to you um, and I, I think that other than that uh, next job is really to say thank you very much for joining me this afternoon and I'll be very very happy to answer as many questions as I possibly can so feel free to um, either unmute yourself um, and go for it or alternatively if you prefer to um, put something in in the chat box there is um, that option and you find that by um, on certainly on my computer it's under the more options that there is a, a chat box that um, that comes up and you can type something in there thank you very much <laughs> for that first message so any questions at all